Please be seated. We'll have music. Christ is risen. Life cannot die, only death can meet death. In Christ resurrected was the truth of Christ proved. In Christ resurrected was Christ's truth proved. Enthusiasm is the spirit of joy channeled through the power of the will. I think Caitlin hit it on the head. If we want to know joy, we must live always in the full expectation of it. Not even earthly happiness can come to those who demand it glumly or who work for it with their eyes to the ground. To achieve happiness, one must work with happiness. To achieve divine joy, one must be keenly enthusiastic in everything one does. Never presume, never brush aside that subtle feeling of doubt which attends false emotional enthusiasm. Try always to let God's joy express itself through you. Thus, your enthusiasm will grow eventually to become his joy. So let's affirm together, first in a loud voice, then this is how Yogananda taught it, to help it penetrate into our consciousness and change our awareness. So first in a loud voice, then in a normal speaking voice, then in a whisper, and finally mentally only. Repeat after me. In everything I do, in everything I do my, enthusiasm soars my enthusiasm soars to embrace infinity. To embrace you're doing it so well. Let's do it loud again. <laughs> in everything I do, in everything I do, my enthusiasm soars. My enthusiasm soars to embrace infinity. To embrace infinity. 
speak. Okay, now just in a regular speaking voice, like you're talking to your friends. In everything I do, my enthusiasm soars to embrace infinity. Now whispering like you're telling your friend a secret or you're telling something to God that you don't want other people to hear. In everything I do, my enthusiasm soars to embrace infinity. And now, totally quietly, only in your own mind, but say these words to God. In everything I do, my enthusiasm soars to embrace infinity. Now please pray silently with me. O perfect bliss, no, just silently, guide me that I express through thee my every feeling. May my enthusiasm be a channel for thy joy. Very well done. Okay, now, Tim. The story of Easter started off not so happy, even though it's one of the happiest moments of Christ's teaching and his life. It started off not so happy. Thousands of years ago, I don't know if you know this, but the world was not always a very happy place. It was pretty dark. Thousands of years ago, the world was very dark. People were not happy. There were rulers that did mean things. It was just not a very nice place. Well, God saw this, and he decided that something had to happen. So what he did, is he sent somebody down to make everything light. And the person he sent down was Jesus. Let's pretend this is Jesus. And what Jesus did, he came down burning with so much light from God that he spread that light to everybody he touched. He taught people how to be happier. He blessed people. There were even people he healed. There was one person that couldn't walk. And Jesus said, now you can walk. And this person stood up. There was another person who was blind. And he said, now you can see. And this person could see. There was a person who was dead, and he said, you're alive now. And the person got up and was alive. And he, he taught his disciples, most importantly. Disciples are the people who really believed in him. And he gave his light to them. And, and they were full of light and love. Have you ever been in a room, maybe in this room, where we had a ceremony where one person has a candle that's lit, and everybody else has candles, and the one person with the light candle gives it, lights someone else's candle, and then they light someone else, and pretty soon the whole room is filled with lit candles. Anybody been in this room for that? Well, that's what Jesus was doing. He was lighting everybody's hearts that way. And it, it, was, it was beautiful. He was doing God's work. But in the world, there was some not good people. And they didn't like him. They didn't like what he was doing. In fact, they wanted him gone. And so, do you know what they did? <sighs> That's right. They took him like that. They wrapped him up in a cloth. And they put him into a small cave. And they put a big rock up against the cave door. And then they thought, that's the end of Jesus. No more light shining, no more teaching people, no more doing miracles. He's gone. Well, his disciples were about as many kids as there are here. 
They were his best friends. They were close to him, and he helped them shine with light. Well, when he was gone, they were shaken. They didn't know what was going to happen. Maybe they would get killed. Maybe they would get put away in caves with big rocks covering them. They didn't know what was going to happen, but they still loved him. So they all got together in one room, and they were just for there for a few days, just going, what happened? We thought he was, he, we, he was the light of God. He was like shining through the whole world. He was healing. I saw him heal somebody. Did you see that? I saw him with a blind person. I saw him with a dead person. He was doing all these things. How could it be that now he's in a cave with a big rock covering it? That's just not right. So this happened for two days, three days. And then Mary, who was one of the girl disciples, she was small, but she was brave. And after a few days, she said, I'm going to go to that cave and I'm going to see. I'm going to go there and see if I can do something right. So she went there. It was morning, but it was dark. She went there by herself. And when she got to where the cave was and the big rock, the rock was gone. And she ran up to the cave and she looked inside. Nobody was there. He was gone. His body was gone. So quickly she ran back to where the other disciples were all grouped together in the one little house. And she said, they have taken away the Lord and I don't know where they put him. And Peter, who was kind of the leader of all the group, he said, I've got to go see. I've got to go see. So they both ran back. They ran back to the cave. And this time, Peter, he just went right in. He just went right into the cave. And he, he looked in the cave, and on the rock where Jesus' body should have been, there was nothing but just the cloth that they wrapped him in. That's all that was left. And he went back to all the disciples by himself. But Mary stayed. She stayed by the cave and she cried and she cried and she cried. She was so sad because he was gone, gone. She cried and cried and finally she thought, I'm going to go look in the cave. So she went in to the cave and she saw the stone where Jesus' body should have been. But then she saw something else. She saw two angels. One was at the top of the rock and the other was at the bottom of the rock and she looked at these angels, and they weren't sad. They were shining bright. They were shining bright, and she was sad and crying. And they said to her, why are you crying? And she said, but they, but they, they took away my Lord. And then the angels looked up, and they saw something even brighter. And Mary turned around, and she saw a man standing at the door. And the man said, why are you crying? And she said, but, the, but they took away the... the, the and, and this man said, Mary. And she looked and it was Jesus. He was standing there just full of light and full of life. And she threw himself, herself at his feet. And he said, don't, don't touch me yet. I haven't yet gone up to God, gone up to heaven. Don't touch me yet. But go back to the disciples and tell them all about this. Tell them that I'm going back to God. And so Mary went back to the disciples and she burst into the room and she said, I have seen the Lord. She was so excited. That was enthusiasm. I have seen the Lord. <laughs> she was, it was, he was alive. And so they went, oh my gosh, you saw him, you saw him. And they were all talking amongst each other. Well, that night when they were all together, all of a sudden in the room, Jesus appeared. He just appeared right there in front of them. And he was full of light. And he said, peace be with you. He said, don't be worried. What he was saying is, don't be worried about anything. Peace be with you. And Mary sat at the edge of the room while Jesus was blessing everybody and filling them with light, so much light, he was just filling them with more and more light. 
Mary sat at the edge of the room, but she felt very, very close in her heart to Jesus. And she knew that he showed that nothing, not even death, can stop God's love from shining. So we celebrate Easter once a year. It's very happy. But really, Easter is any time, any time of the year, that we overcome sadness and darkness with the light of Christ. So uh, we're going to do a reading first. We have a special treat for you this morning um, that Jatish will explain. Okay. Well, I don't want to keep you in suspense. Uh, Swami Kriyananda has recorded an Easter message for us, so we'll play that. But I'll do the reading for this week, which is the resurrection for every soul. Okay, and the children can leave if they want, or they can stay and, and watch. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. In the Gospel of St. John, chapter 20, we read the inspiring account of Jesus' resurrection. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh unto Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord. Then that same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for the fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in their midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. The resurrection of Jesus, doubted by many, but affirmed by those who were close to him, was a miraculous event, the one not unique in history. For many great saints of other religions have appeared to their disciples after death. Sometimes their appearances have been as that of Jesus was, in flesh and blood form, and not only in vision. Paramahansa Yogananda relates in Autobiography of a Yogi the account of his guru, Sri Yukteswar's resurrection, after his earthly passing. Miracles of this type are revealed only rarely to the masses, but accounts of them, related by men and women of reputed truthfulness, have inspired many devotees with faith in the reality of subtler than material states of existence. Resurrection, Yogananda explained, means transformation, ultimately from any lower state of being to a higher one. Worldly consciousness cannot imagine such transformation except in terms of, perhaps, an improvement of the present mess of pottage with the addition of a new flavoring. Divine consciousness, however, is capable of taking the base metal of worldliness and transforming it into the spiritual gold of divine wisdom and love. In keeping with this truth, the Bhagavad Gita in the ninth chapter tells us, Ah, ye who into this world are come, fleeting and false, set your faith fast on me, fix heart and thought on me, adore me, bring offerings to me, make me protestations, make me your supremest joy, and undivided unto me, unto my rest, your spirits shall be guided. 
Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. Now on the screen over here, we'll have Swami's message. Easter has always been a very happy time. My mother would make a big thing of it. She would, I remember she would make a lake on the, on the dining room table made of a mirror. And then she'd put skaters on it and so on. She knew that I had a sense of beauty, so she did it for me primarily. And uh, with beautiful flowers and everything, I still remember the beauty of it. But the meaning of it, I did not understand until... I met Paramahansa Yogananda, and I discovered the, the role of Christianity is to imitate Christ. He did not come into this world to tell us how great he was. He came to show us how great we can be, how great we are in our potential. We have the potential to become like him, and our whole life should be... Uh, as an imitation of his actions. Don't ever say, well, he could do it. I can't do it. I'm not like him. It's your job to become like him. I remember one time many years ago, um, because I was wearing a beard and nobody in those days wore beards, a group of Masons asked me to be Christ in a pageant on Gethsemane. And I never, I didn't speak words. I just sort of sighed and uh, looked miserable and so on. <laughs> anyway, the next day, um, Yogananda asked me about it, and he, he said, many people said, you look like Christ. I said, sir, I'd much rather be like him than look like him. And he quite casually said, that will come. That's the way he saw us all. He saw our potential. That's how Christ looks at you. He sees your potential. So the important thing in the lesson of Christianity is not the crucifixion. The crucifixion is the path to that absolute beatitude that is the goal of it. We should not think in terms of I'm being holy because I'm suffering. A true saint is one who doesn't suffer even if his body suffers, even if the world persecutes him, even if he's burned at the cross. He must accept everything as coming from God and as a part of His grace. So the resurrection that is implied and uh, symbolized by Easter is really, in a sense, the most important Christian holiday because all of us should try to resurrect ourselves. Now, what does this mean in daily life? It means that, well, you know the saying, this day marks the beginning of the rest of my life. It's the first day of the rest of my life. That is to say, from now on I can change. Don't look at the past. This is why reincarnation is such a necessary fact. We Suppose you've been a murderer. If you've always got the burden of that sin weighing upon you, how will you ever come out of it? How will you ever come out of drinking excessively and all your different habits? You have to have a new start. Yogananda one time, in fact, picked up a baby and nearly dropped it because he saw a murderer had been born in that little body. But it gives you a new start in life. And so every day should be a day of resurrection. Every breath, Lahiri Mahajan said, is in fact the beginning of a new life. If when you inhale, you if you exhale, Exhale all your bad habits. This is a part of affirmation that you throw out of your mind all the things that you want to overcome. And you can change. Yogananda said to me, habits can be changed in a day. They can be changed in a breath. Throw the old out and inhale and bring in the new. And with Easter, it's a reminder once a year, more than New Year's Day, when you make, a, make resolutions that most people break within a few hours. But on Easter, tell yourself, as Christ resurrected himself, 
I want to resurrect myself. Whatever I have been, whatever faults I have had, whatever attachments I have had, whatever I've done wrong in my life, that belongs to the past from today onward. And make that your affirmation this Easter Sunday. From now on, I will be a saint. From now on, I will be a true Christian by living in the love of Christ. I will be in love with God as he was. And don't say, well, but I'm not pure. You can be pure. Don't worry about what you've done. Gold, though it's covered with mud, remains gold. And though you have been many done, performed many sins, never tell yourself, I am a sinner. Affirm, I am a saint. A saint, Yogananda said, is a sinner who never gave up. You will find that even with a breath, even with a day, with a single affirmation, if you do it with power, you can change your life, you can change the direction of your life. I had a dream some years ago in Florence, Italy. And in that dream I saw many people, worldly people, um, greedy people, avaricious people, mafiosi, criminal types. And I realized that all of them are seeking just one thing. They all want happiness. They don't understand how they'll find it, and so they find it on lower octaves, you might say. The real, the highest octave of happiness is bliss. Human happiness, emotional happiness, is a lower octave. Pleasure is a lower octave still. But then even lower octaves, criminals may think by revenge, by getting even, by killing people, they will find happiness. But everybody in the world is seeking bliss, and the only thing is they don't know it yet. But they all have this, they're motivated by this basic desire. And I woke up understanding that that is the motive that I should have for loving everybody. And from then on, I have loved everybody. I, I looked for a piece of paper, it was a hotel room, and I couldn't use they give you note to note paper to write on. There was none. Finally I found a little round doily under a glass and I, under a glass and I wrote these thoughts out. But they've remained firmly embedded in my mind. And I would urge you to have that same thought. Everybody is your brother and sister. Everybody. You should love everybody. Because everybody really wants that single bliss. And even if they kill you, even if they persecute you, even if they try to harm you, they're just trying to get unhappiness out of their life, wrong things that they consider wrong out of their lives. What they really are looking for is bliss. Love everybody. And let this Easter be your resolution that from now on I will love everyone. I will, above all, try to imitate Christ in his not his death only, his willingness to accept what was not suffering for him. His only pain on the cross was saying, Father, forgive them. They know not what they, what they do. He only felt suffering for human ignorance. That was his suffering. He didn't feel pain in himself. And the Easter is the final message of Christianity. If you follow this truth to the end, you will be resurrected in God. God bless you. Thank you to everyone who helped us watch this video. I'll share a few words also. Um, usually we read, before Sunday service, we read an excerpt from uh, Whispers from Eternity, but... There's a selection from one of my favorite books of Master's Metaphysical Meditations that just seems so beautiful today. It's called The Transfiguring Christ. Christ has ever abided in me. He has preached through my consciousness to all my rowdy and hypocritical thoughts. With the magic wand of meditative intuition, he has stilled the storms in the sea of my life and of many other lives. I was mentally blind. My will was lame. 
but I was healed by the awakened Christ in me. Christ walked on the restless waters of my mind. Yet the Judas of restlessness and ignorance, deluded by the Satan of sense lures, betrayed in me the Christ calmness, the Christ joy, and crucified the divine on the cross of forgetfulness. Christ commanded my dead wisdom to come forth from its sackcloth of delusion and raised my wisdom to new life. At last, my will, faith, intuition, purity, hope, meditation, right desires, good habits, self-control, sense aboveness, devotion, and wisdom. All these disciples obeyed the commandments of the Christ who appeared on the high mountain of my meditation. O living Christ, manifest in the body, or excuse me, O living Christ, present in the body of Jesus and in all of us, manifest thyself in the essence of thy glory, in the strength of thy light, in the power of thy perfect wisdom. Such a beautiful passage, so spiritually powerful. In the, uh, both in Tim's story and in the passage that we read from Rays of the One Light, we focused on that simple episode where Christ appeared to the disciples and said, after the crucifixion, after the incredible drama of Easter, the coming into Jerusalem, the standing and looking down and saying, Ah, Jerusalem, Christ saying, Ah, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, I would have gathered thee like a mother hen gathers her chicks, but you would have it not. And this represents, as in that we read in this passage, the, those parts of our minds, restless, hypocritical, turning away from the light, we all have them. And Christ can't gather, the inner Christ can't bring those qualities that are pulling away. He can't bring them into the fold of higher consciousness. But in another passage in the Bible, Christ says, where two or more are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And that's a very interesting passage. And people interpret it in the traditional ways. Those who come into church on Sunday, Christ is there. But just because you come into a church doesn't mean you've gathered in Christ's name. What it means to gather in Christ's name is to be immersed in the thought of him, to be immersed in his presence within you. And when you get people coming together, immersed in devotion for Christ, immersed in awareness of his presence, there Christ is. It could be on a mountaintop, it could be in a prison, it could be in the subway, it doesn't matter. The sanctity comes from the consciousness of souls dedicating their lives. And such is the power of spiritual community. When you get hundreds of people living together in this way, serving and dedicating their life to God, God comes and he blesses that community. And all who come and visit or walk the grounds or see the beautiful gardens and tulips They are blessed by Christ's presence. But Master explains it even more profoundly what it means when two or more are gathered in my name. He said, when two or three of our thoughts are are focused on the Christ, he responds. And so in our meditation, we have to transcend that level where it's just mechanical. Now I do this technique, now I do that technique. But we have to come to the point eventually in all of our efforts where we lovingly join all of our thoughts. It's like a beautiful mingling of energy and colors and patterns. And those thoughts that want to say, no, I want to play in the world. I want to be restless. I want to assert my own ego will. 
those thoughts, we just say, not now. You can come back later, but not now. And we lovingly, willingly, enthusiastically say, I want my thoughts to be focused on Christ. I want this. Not because somebody's telling me to do it, not because I, it's some external pressure that I should do it, but because I want to do this. I want my thoughts to be gathered together inwardly in the presence of Christ. And then what happens? He appears within us and he says, peace be unto thee. Peace will be yours. And that's what we can experience each and every one of us every single day if we gather our thoughts together in love and dedication and and willing focus on God and Christ and Guru, then he appears and he blesses us with his peace and his love and his joy. And that, that image, it's really, it's symbolic of the disciples gathered together in that little darkened room But then Christ appears, that light appears, and says, peace be unto you. And so it is internally. We can go through that same process. And what is the Christ consciousness? There's our guru, Yoganandaji, gave, he gave such a beautiful understanding. And I've heard many Christians say, people who are raised in the Christian faith said, I never understood Christianity. I never understood who Christ was till I read Yogananda's explanation of it. And then I appreciated really what his mission was. And in fact, Yogananda called his coming to the West and the teachings that he did the second coming of Christ because he was helping us in the West to understand. And, you know, similarly, I've had friends in India who their most beloved scripture is the Bhagavad Gita, comparable to our Bible. And I've had Indian friends tell me, I never understood the Gita, though I've read it all my life and my parents quoted it to me from childhood until I read Yogananda's interpretation of it. And so it takes, this was Yogananda's great mission, In our time, we are going through a period of transition where the fundamental Christians are warring against uh, each other. The fundamental Hindus are warring with each other. But at this time, Yogananda came to show it's all about consciousness. It's not what church you go to. It's not what creed you follow, it's none of you, or ceremonies or rituals that you perform. Jesus was an enlightened master who had totally merged his consciousness with Christ consciousness. The Christ consciousness, as Yogananda explained, is the presence of the omnipresent Father, of God, the Father, Mother, present through in the farthest stretch of infinity, and it's that consciousness which is present in the smallest atom. The sparrow falls with not, out, the sparrow falls not without his sight, and every hair on your head is counted, because that omnipresent consciousness of God manifests from age to age in these great saviors of mankind, of whom. Jesus the man was one. He was emerged in that Christ consciousness. Yogananda was one. Moses was one. Buddha was one. They come from time to time to reflect that consciousness of God the Father in creation. And Swami Kriyananda in a passage talking about the Guru gave such a beautiful image that has helped me so much in thinking about Christ consciousness, thinking about discipleship. He said, the saviors of mankind, and this today we're talking particularly about 
Jesus, they are like windows. And what do windows do? They have, we can think of three functions that they serve. One is they protect us from the rain and the adverse elements. If it's cold and rainy out, we close the window. So these great avatars, these saviors, they protect us from our own bad karma. They protect us from things that, energy patterns that we sent in the past, sent out in the past, that by our own actions will draw suffering to us. So these great souls who are immersed in Christ consciousness, they take on some of our karma, just as Christ took on the karma of his disciples and of those who love him. It wasn't limited to those times. But just because you say you're a Christian doesn't mean he will take on your karma. He will. It's only if we are immersed in him, are gathered in his name, then he can take on your karma. Just as St. Francis of Assisi, there's a beautiful chapel that we visited in Italy many times over the years. It's called... It's in a remote mountain area, and it's where St. Francis received the stigmata. And now they've built a little chapel there. It's called La Verna. And there is a little chapel there that has been built subsequently. At the time, it was just a rock on, on a mountain. And Christ would come there every day to St. Francis as he prayed with total focus of heart and mind. And you can go there today, and you can feel the power of Christ's presence there. So the, these great avatars protect us, and they, like a window, protects us. But a window also lets in light. A window shines on us, and, we, and just as the avatars come into the darkness of our mind, to the despair of our heart, to the hopelessness, to the pain, to the suffering, all the things that happen, as it says in the Gita, in that passage, into this world, false and fleeting. So that light of the, of the Christ consciousness comes, and we can look at everything and we say, it's not what it appears to be. Behind the shadow of suffering is only light. And I know this because I feel it within myself. I know, just as Christ showed us that even through all that drama and the hatred and the violence and the suffering and the total despair of the disciples, there he came in his radiant glory and he said, peace be unto you. And finally, a third thing that a window does. We have a wonderful architect in our community, Ponderanga, and one of the things I love the most about the buildings he designs are where he places the windows because every window is placed in such a way that it frames a beautiful vista. Vistas you wouldn't have noticed without that window. And that's what the third function that these Christ souls serve for us. They frame what it means to be living in Christ consciousness. This is what it looks like, a life lived in God. This is the humor, the joy, the power, the glory, the kindness, the compassion, the wisdom. This is what it looks like. And I can see it by the light that he's shining on me. And so it is, as we celebrate this day of Easter, We need to know, we need to live in the the thought that as we gather our thoughts, as we gather our activities and focus them on Christ consciousness, he will appear within us and he will show us the way so that we never need walk in darkness. We never need fear to be present in our lives. How is doubt possible when we see and know and feel Christ's presence within us always? God bless you.
I am thine, thou art mine, hand in hand forever. Love in thee, I live free, dancing in thy light. Not that I was remains, gone is the night. Now I rest, ever blessed, fed by thy sight. I am Thou art mine, and in hand forever, thine, thine, I am thine, I am thine forever, I am thine, thou art mine, and in hand Dancing.